Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I have a gentleman to introduce you tonight. Matt Fulbrook is his name. He's a corporate governance expert, advisor, researcher, and educator. And he's got a couple of different uh, podcasts on uh, on governance that we're going to talk about. Uh, he uh, has come highly recommended to me as someone who can really inspire people to uh, better corporate governance, which I think is something that we all have to pay some attention to. Matt, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, Brian. So how'd you get into this this governance gig and and what are these two uh, podcasts that you have, sir? Yeah, I, you know, I don't think you would believe me if I told you anything other than the truth, which is it was a complete accident. It was the very beginning of my career. I was at school for literature and philosophy at the University of Toronto. This is about 25 years ago and needed a way to put food on the table and and was looking for research positions and ended up on a project at the Rotman School of Management right at the very beginning of when the university was starting to zero in on corporate governance. This is right in the wake of Enron and WorldCom and Tyco and Nortel and all these catastrophes that had happened right at the same time. And just by, I think, sheer chance, the project ended up being a bit of a hit. And so the research center ended up needing somebody to run it. And I was the only one who who was available. And that ended up sparking a career that ended up with me running that research center until three years ago and doing consulting work with boards and executives for the last 15 years and becoming a sort of obnoxious, provocative guy on the governance scene for especially the last two or three years. And and part of that has been starting my podcast. One is called One Minute Governance, and it's exactly like it sounds, short episodes, each one on some kind of idiosyncratic governance topic. And then one, uh, sorry, sound up governance, which is sort of a longer form interview driven thing where I feature guests that are a little bit unconventional in the governance world. And I, and I got to ask you also a bass player for two bands. Yeah, thanks. Well, that, so there's one real main band called Casey Roberts and the Live Revolution. I'm very spoiled. This is a touring original act. We put out our seventh album in 2022. We're still out there making new music and doing shows. We've got a couple of shows coming up in Toronto in, in April or maybe early May and in June and another one in the fall. So, yeah, it's, uh, I'm a bass player and I'm very, very lucky to have great musicians in my life. Fantastic. Sounds like a, an interesting, uh, interesting, uh, eclectic uh, occupation for you. Yeah, for you. thanks. So let's come back to governance. So why do you think uh, corporate governance is so critically important? Yeah, I think the the part of the answer to your question starts with the actually trying to define what it is, because I realized it took me at least 15 years in my career before it occurred to me that if somebody just walked up to me on the street and said, okay, so your job is to research corporate governance, what is that? I probably would have said something like, well, corporate governance is the way that corporations are governed. And it started to really bother me that I and most of the other people in the space would vaguely just talk about structure and policy and practice and so on, but not actually say, okay, but corporate governance is X and articulated in a way that anyone might understand. So I started realizing that when I think about it, it's separate from regulation, which is the rules we have to follow. It's separate from just running the business, which is doing stuff. So what is governance to me is the sum total of all the decisions that happen in a corporation. So whether we're looking at the board, whether we're looking at the people on the front lines, everything in between. We might be talking about decisions that are made with great intent, or we might be talking about decisions that are super consequential or ones that are mundane and happen by accident. All of that to me is corporate governance. And to zoom out and, and answer your question directly, why is this important? Well, I mean, now that's, that becomes self-evident, right? We're talking about every decision that happens throughout an organization and being interested in how we make those decisions is where the study and work of all the people in these organizations, this is where it gets really interesting because it turns out human beings are pretty bad at making decisions. Well, that's an interesting definition because uh, I thought corporate governance was all about sort of the board. You're you're widening it fairly dramatically to all decisions within management. Yeah. So this is this is, I think, where I maybe get the most pushback. And I'm glad that you you went right there because we certainly, when we talk to any corporate director or any senior executive for that matter, and say, you know, would you say that a big part of your job is corporate governance? They will 
undeniably say, yes, of course, that's, you know, it's most of my job. Whereas if you ask, let's say the teller at a bank is part of your job, corporate governance to, to say, I don't know what you're talking about. So I think that that's, that is, it's a totally fair thing because when we look at a board, we'll say the board's job is governance. But to me, what's missing, as I said, is, well, that doesn't mean that we know what that is. And I do go into boardrooms and I say, okay, well, let's come up with a, a common definition of what we believe governance is. And it turns out boards don't know right? They might say, well, it's oversight. They might say it's accountability. They might say that it's, you know, fiduciary duty, but that doesn't help us to, again, walk in the room and do it. So when we frame it as decisions, that really puts a light bulb over the director's heads and the executives. And they say, ah, right. Now I understand. I always instinctively thought that governance and compliance were separate. I always instinctively thought that governance and the law were separate, but now that I think of it as decisions, it's helpful. But as you say, when we think of it as decisions, the aperture naturally widens because everybody in an entire throughout the organization is making decisions, and the decisions the board makes affect the de decisions below them, and the decisions that the people at the bottom make also affect the people above them. Well, that's interesting because I hadn't thought about it that way. So decisions at the board level are, I think. Usually, and, and and I think you've identified in some of the the, the postings I've seen uh, times where it's not democratic, but usually should be democratic. That every every director should have effectively one vote. It should be a like a democratic kind of uh, a system. Um, um, you know, there are some cases where people have super votes and super majorities and stuff like that um, because of two different classes of stock, or or, right. the, or the chairman and CEO has far greater power than uh, than he or she uh, actually deserves on paper. But it should be democratic. But in the balance of an organization, isn't it autocratic? Yeah, it's really, it's a super interesting set of, of circumstances you've just described. So let's just take a normal, maybe we'll go to one end of an, of an extreme. Let's take my little corporation that's just me, right? So I, it's, I'm the only shareholder, I'm the only board member, I'm the only employee. And so I can just do what I want. And that doesn't mean I'm not accountable to whatever other stakeholders might be affected. But for the most part, the only person who's really affected is me and my clients. And so at, the, at, at that end of the spectrum, it autocratic in nature, it makes sense, right? Why would anyone else really want to have any influence? Now, if we're talking about a large multinational listed company with many, 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 many shareholders, it's the complete opposite end of the spectrum, where all those shareholders, in theory, get one vote attached to a share. Collectively, they're able to, for instance, elect board members. And then the board also only has authority collectively. Each individual director, once they've been elected, they only have authority through the one vote they have. They may feel like they've got more authority than that, but they don't. A board only has authority collectively. And then they can choose do we want to hire management? Most of them will say, of course, we need a CEO, for example, to run the bank. So they hire management. And then the, the flow of accountability goes the other direction where management is accountable to the board and the board is accountable to shareholders and other stakeholders. You've got that other wrinkle that you mentioned with dual class. But that's again, that's only in that outside sphere of shareholders where you may have a large number of shareholders, but only one of them has real voting control, they can autocratically elect a board. But then the board still has the same role, whether it's in a dual class environment or not. They have one vote each, and then it's, they, they collectively make decisions that are hopefully well aligned with the interests of shareholders and other stakeholders. But this is, it's, I think you're describing something that's really interesting and complex, but fundamentally, the governance part of it, the decision-making part of it, these are only condi certain conditions that affect it. And I haven't gotten to my definition of good governance yet, which I'll get to in a moment, but I'll pause to let you follow up. Well, no, that's interesting because I have been, you know, privy to a couple of places where there were a uh, chairman um, or other uh, board members that uh, represented a different class of stock and, yeah. and, and they had super votes. They may not have on paper had super votes, yeah. um, but the reality is that when people knew they controlled uh, a whole bunch more votes and could, uh, you know, and, and we've seen, you know, Rogers in the press uh, a, yeah. a great deal in the last little while where, where uh, you know, one individual that had a whole bunch of votes in behind, voting votes in behind him, um, 
could influence dramatically what happened to the board, even though others may have disagreed. Anyway, yeah. interesting discussion, though. We got to take a break for some messages, and we'll be back in two minutes with Matt Fulbrook, a governance expert. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour Saga 960. Matt Fulbrook is my guest tonight. He is a governance expert. He's got uh, two podcasts that he does on uh, governance. One is the, do you call it the One Minute uh, Governance Podcast? One Minute Governance, OMG. Yeah, that's right. OMG. And then your longer podcast is called what? Called Sound Up Governance, and that's interview driven. Fantastic. Um, you said you were going to get to your definition of good governance. What's the definition yeah. of good governance, Matt? So if we if we look back at my definition of corporate governance being it's the sum total of all the decisions that happen in, an, in a corporation, then when I started wondering to myself, and here I am sitting in classrooms trying to educate corporate directors and executives on how to do their jobs well and going in as a consultant to try to help them do their jobs well, and I'm thinking, shoot, you know, I'm really struggling to think of what I think good looks like. And so the best thing I knew how to do was to look back at all, at my experience of all the things that I considered to be good that had happened in all the boardrooms I've been in. And at that point, I'd been in over 200 boardrooms and watched lots of organizations do really interesting stuff. And I realized, you know, the good stuff that happens is when we're being, or by we, I mean, collectively the board and management and whoever other, whoever else they have in the room helping them, when they're being intentional about the conditions that affect their decisions. So I've got on this board over my shoulder here, uh, an expression that says intentionally cultivating effective conditions. The longer form of my definition of good governance is good governance is intentionally cultivating effective conditions for making decisions. So the difference between good and not good is being intentional. And conditions is doing a lot of heavy lifting here, right? So conditions really, it's everything from all the obvious stuff, like what information are we providing and how and when. It's also who's in the room and what skills do they have. It's the agendas, but it's also less obvious stuff like the physical space, the lighting and temperature affect the way that we engage in decisions that affect our cognitive behavior, food and caffeine and all these things that change the way that we show up and perform are conditions that matter. And being intentional about those conditions is something that I think is a really short way for us to walk in the room and know the difference between what's good and what's not good. And, and each person can show up and be useful in a different way. That's interesting. And so this intention is something, obviously, that you think that uh, that board manager, board members, uh, management people, et cetera, have to think about uh, before they have a meeting before they have a board meeting or a management meeting or executive meeting or something or other meeting to decide uh, any decision. Yeah. So it's before and during and after. So Brian, you might show up for a board meeting and say, okay, we're about to have a conversation about some kind of nuts and bolts governance thing. And we've got a lawyer in the room and I'd really want to make sure I get their perspective. So why don't I decide to sit next to them for this conversation. So I've got the opportunity to kind of nudge them and ask for points of clarity. Or you might say, you know what, the room was really cold last time. And we found that really distracting. Everybody kept complaining about it. Maybe I'm going to reach out to the building maintenance and make sure that the room's a comfortable temperature before we walk in. Or you might say, you know what, I'm finding this information that I've received before the meeting really confusing. I bet other people are too. Why don't I take a couple of steps and reach out beforehand and see if I can get a little bit more clarity or maybe some infographics or illustrations to help us get more involved. All this stuff matters because ultimately what we're trying to do is increase the probability that the decision has a good result. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think I think that some people got a very different attitude toward uh, what uh, what should happen in a meeting. I had one person tell me at one point in time, never go into a a board meeting unless you know that you're going to win the vote. Um, so <laughs> yeah. that was sort of an attitude that it was a process that one needed to go through and manage um, rather than one that you're sort of describing where you want to actually increase the probability of discussion, information sharing, and and democratic decision making. Yeah, I love what you're saying because I think if we sort of step back and ask ourselves, what do we think a board is for? Or maybe a better way to put it is, how do we think 
what do we think a board that's really doing something useful looks like? And I think that, you know, yes, on the one hand, we might look at a board and say, oh, it's such a time sink. They're really inefficient. I wish I could just do whatever I wanted. All I care about here is walking into the room, getting the decision that I need as fast as possible and leaving. But I think there's a missed opportunity there, which is no matter how our board is constructed, we've got a diverse group of perspectives, smart people who have an opportunity if we give it to them and if we empower them in the right way to help us see opportunities we might not usually see or help us identify risks we might not fully understand and certainly provide perspectives and interesting questions to the paths we, we might travel. And just walking in the room and trying to force decisions through is skipping over that opportunity to engage these people in not just dialogue, but also the exploration of what might be possible for our corporation. You know, I used to work for Jim Pattison of the Jim Pattison Group, yeah. $9 billion company owned by one guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, comes back to almost your definition of your own company, where he was a sole proprietor, he was a billionaire. He didn't need anyone else uh, to agree with, uh, with what he did. But he went beyond what you could ever imagine in regards to good corporate governance. He had a board. And I asked him once why he had a board of directors when he owned 100% of the uh, the shares of the company. And he said, because I want to get good advice. Yeah. And he really did go into those board meetings with an attitude of uh, of, of diversity of opinion, um, information sharing, and really soliciting their uh, their advice and recommendations um, and, and cautions, as you say, uh, even though he could make 100% of the decision himself. Yeah, it's a really good example. And I think that these these founder controlled or family controlled examples are ones that maybe get some unwarranted flack in the press. You mentioned Rogers really briefly before, and of course we can all point to embarrassing failures. But I think these models also, they've got this kind of hidden super power, which is exactly as you've described with Jimmy Patterson, they can kind of choose their own adventure. So if we're talking about this intentionality thing, their control over the conditions is even greater than it is in any other type of organization where they could say, you know what I really need from my board, I think that I can only get by having board meetings on the top of a mountain. So that's what we're going to do, right? And so they can make these really wild swings if they need to in service of making great decisions where say uh, the board of a large, complex, widely held company, they don't quite have as much authority or they've got the authority, but it's much harder to get these unusual things happening. So I, I love the example of, look, he knew what he needed. He designed the model intentionally and it sounds to me like well it's been not just because of the, his success but because of your experience describing it it was something that really worked i spoke with john tory uh, at one point yeah. in time the, the former mayor of toronto and he said relative to good decision making in politics but also in uh, corporate he said if you want to have really good decisions make sure you've got the unusual suspects at the table yeah yeah, I think that uh, first of all, I agree. And second of all, there's, we can all picture, you know, those people who uh, I'll, I'll describe a couple of characters really briefly with those relentless, annoying question askers, or those people who believe that they're playing devil's advocate, but really they're just being annoying. Or there's people who think they're there to represent a very particular set of interests, but never change their minds. For sure, those are unusual suspects and they're kind of annoying and, and distracting. But I think he's right in the sense that, look, we need perspectives around the room that are going to help us see around corners that we didn't even know existed. Because if we can't look around those corners, we don't even know what we're missing. But having them in the room isn't enough, right? We need other conditions, too, to make sure they're empowered to participate, make sure they're empowered to have their voices heard, make sure that they don't, they're not unconstrained so that they just sort of go wild and disrupt everything. All these things matter. So this is a long way of agreeing and saying just having them there isn't enough. Is there a, you know, an attitude in management that I think is uh, that I'm, I'm questioned, is it key uh, to having good governance and uh, good decision-making? I, I, um, you know, come back to Jim Pattison uh, for a second. He would have regular, um, divisional management meetings with all of his companies. And he would have several different people that report to him that were charged with analyzing the strategic plan, the operating plan, the financial results, et cetera, of the different businesses. And I was always amazed 
he would get these people in meetings to ask questions and speak first. And when decisions were, um, you know, put forward to the room, he would ask everyone else that reported to him to to voice their opinions first. Um, and uh, and then he would listen to everybody, synthesize what everyone else said, and then finally come to his decision, which he owned 100 percent of the company. He had the right to. Yeah, I've had other people that I've worked with that always want to speak first. Yeah. Because they're the decision maker. And so, yeah. you know, I, I, I might as well decide. And if I don't decide, why am I the decision maker? Why am I the boss? And so one has got a very sort of solicitation of all the other opinions in the room attitude. The other one is, no, I'm the boss. I'm, I've got to decide. It's it's the buck stops with me. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think you're, you're, you've described a couple of different approaches where it sounds to me like both of those have said, you know, they've got a clear idea of what they want. And they're in a way doing what I say good governance is and and saying, okay, well, I'm going to cultivate conditions that are going to more likely to get me what I need. And one of them says, I'm going to get what I need by listening. And the other one says, I'm going to get what I need by talking. But I'll, I'll tell you, the the most common phone call that I get, and I'm talking, you know, at least one a week is from a CEO, usually someone I've never met. They'll call me and they'll say, Matt, I Googled, I found you, you're the board guy. And I just want to tell you, my board is driving me crazy. And they're always in the weeds. They never ask good questions. They're like, you're they're just, you know, they're totally useless. What's wrong with them? And, and I'll usually say that sounds that's frustrating. That's awful. I feel really badly for you. And I wonder what are some of the things you've tried to make things better? And, you know, they usually, I use, I, I did some their answers up in a Simpsons quote, which is they usually reply by saying, I've tried nothing and I'm all out of ideas. And, and I say, that's fair, right? Because the world isn't full of examples of CEOs doing amazing things to engage their boards in ways that get them out of the weeds and so on, right? It's not like you can call all your buddies and get great ideas, but let's acknowledge the fact that we as CEOs or board members or board chairs or whoever, each of us has an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm not getting what I want out of this. And I'd like to try something different. And it can start with these CEOs by telling their boards, look, I'm not sure what to try, but I'm not getting what I need here. And let me try to describe to you what I'm hoping to get. And let's try a couple of different things to see if we can get there. So I was involved in one of these uh, directors and officer um courses at one point in time, uh, the one uh, run by DeGroote uh, mm -hmm. Business School. And uh, the key that they had, I think, was the separation between setting strategy versus operating. And yeah. the board had to focus on setting strategy, making those decisions, but not get involved in day-to-day -day operations. And day-to-day -day operations were the responsibility of the CEO and whoever he hired. Is that helpful or not helpful? It's really important to acknowledge but I'm going to tell you something that uh, this is very recent to me where I've suddenly realized that, yes, we need to acknowledge this and it's not even close to enough. So I started gathering some data when I when all of my courses and everything went virtual during COVID. All of my exercises went virtual, it gave me an opportunity to gather data. And one of the questions that I would ask was on a scale of one being deeply operational to 10 being highly strategic, where does your board typically operate? And we get a distribution of answers. But almost everybody is a seven and below. And then I asked them on the same scale of deeply operational being one and 10 being highly strategic, where should your board typically operate in your opinion? And almost everybody migrates to above a seven. And so we've got, and this is about a thousand participants, senior executives and board directors from all sectors. Everybody wants to go from operational to strategic in the boardroom, every single one of them. But they don't do and it. Well, the, and there's the question, as you say, because the conventional thinking is as long as we say it out loud and maybe we allocate more time to strategy and our agendas, things are going to get better. But it turns out that doesn't work. So what's missing? And that's a really important question because it only occurred to me, this is in the last, I don't know, two months or so to ask them, okay, so we've all decided we want to be at an eight, let's say out of 10. I'll say to them, would anyone like to try to describe an eight? 
So describe to me the behavior that you're modeling or what's actually happening in the boardroom that you would describe as an eight. And honestly, almost everybody struggles to describe it. And part of the reason is that no conventional, normal boardroom behavior, it feels strategic. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about something that's forward looking. It doesn't matter if we've allocated five minutes or five hours. What we are missing is defining the actual behavior. So I like what you're saying, and I think it's 100% correct, and everybody I've ever met would agree with you. But the piece that's missing is, okay, so how do we do it? And I'm only just starting to get some ideas, but this is it's because it's very fresh. I mean, no board that I've met so far is able to confidently say, I know exactly how to get from a five to an eight. That's it. That's really interesting. You know, I think part of it is that implementation of whatever the decision is, is critically important. And, uh, and, and without a good implementation, good operations, um, you're not going to have good decisions. Uh, you know, I had an organization behavior professor at business school once who used to tell me that there's no right and wrong decisions, only right and wrong implementations. I never agreed with that because um, right. I do think that there's bad decisions. Uh, but uh, but his point was a bad decision well implemented can be more successful than a good decision poorly implemented. Right. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to take what you just said and frame it slightly more cynically for the in a self-serving way, if, you, if you'll permit me, which is a lot of my peers like to frame good governance based on corporate performance. So they'll say, for example, well, that organization must have good governance because they've had great financial performance for the last 10 years. And I that kind of wigs me out a little bit, honestly, because when I think about it, we're making decisions under conditions of uncertainty, right? And there's no decision, there's no inputs, there's no conditions we might create that decrease the probability of failure to zero or increase the probability of success to 100. There's no guarantees. All we can do is do our best. And so if we have a bad result, to me, that doesn't indicate bad governance, but that just does give us more decisions that we have to make. Okay, look, we had a bad result. The strategy is not working out the way that we wanted to. We have to understand. We have to identify the new paths we might travel and assess them and try to course correct. Which to me is just more cultivation of effective conditions. So, that I I think that I agree with you in the sense that yes, implementation matters a lot right? It, it's, if without implementation, like we got actually got to do stuff with our company. It matters. And there's nothing we can do that guarantees success. So all we can do is keep on making decisions and and having good conditions for those decisions. Am I, am I selling this well to you? I, I, cause I don't feel well, like but no, it, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting topic. And, 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 you know, people can debate. I had a conversation slash debate once with someone where we were talking about all the negative traits in the press about Elon Musk uh, as yeah. to how he ran the company, how he interacted with uh, people, uh, autocratic nature, um, you know, telling people what to do, not being interested in what anyone else had to say, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, yeah, but look at his performance. He's a billionaire. It works. Yeah. There's a, the, if, if we're, if I sort of use that conditions word, there's a lot of conditions that he, you know, he accidentally stumbled into some great conditions. He found himself in a really advantageous position. But I think one of the things you're talking about that's really important is a person's character is different from corporate governance, right? And and I think that this is where we kind of make a... Uh, we accidentally conflate our values with our assessment of an organization and its governance. I had a, a, just sticking with the the Elon Musk example, or more generally Tesla. There were some really unbelievable to me headlines a few weeks ago about their board chair, whose shares in Tesla had become worth uh, some obnoxious amount of money. I can't remember how much it was, and the institutional investors were really up in arms, saying this is a, a the numbers too big. And I stepped back and I thought, well. You know, the reason why corporate directors own shares in the stock or own shares in the companies on the boards where they sit is because institutional investors put pressure on them to do so. And so they do. And this board chair happens to have been the chair of the board of the company whose stock has performed the best 
over the past 10 years. And you're saying that it became too valuable and that's the problem. It's, it's just this, there's a, a, an unusual disconnect between the value judgment and what makes us feel things. And on the, on one hand, and then on the other hand, well, is this good or bad governance? And I think the answer is, you know, we're making a, we're accidentally creating a false analogy here. We got to take a break for some messages and we're going to be back in just two minutes with that uh, Matt Fulbrook, who's a governance expert talking a little bit about corporate governance and, and how you do it right. Uh, it's got some interesting ideas. Stay with us, everyone back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Matt Fulbrook. He is an expert on uh, corporate governance. He runs uh, two podcasts that uh, are operational on a regular uh, basis. Uh, one is uh, called the, the One Minute Governance, uh, OMG um, for short. And then the other one is, uh, is it, what's the name of it? Sound Up Governance. Sound Up Governance. Uh, and uh, you interview people there on appropriate uh, corporate governance and and uh, you are a governance advisor, expert, writer, researcher, educator, coach with over 20 years experience helping boards of directors and senior executives make uh, great decisions. Um, you're also a bass player huh. for Casey Roberts and the Live Revolution. Um, when, when do I get to go see Casey Roberts and the Live Revolution? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. I, You know what? I should have had my calendar open, but we've got a show. I'll give you the date in a second. It is May 3rd at the Rivoli in Toronto, and then another one uh, at, on June 7th at Drum Taberna, uh, which is, I, I don't know if you've been to Drum, which is an amazing venue in Toronto. Uh, it's it's one of the only legit after hours venues that exist in the city. And so they have music most nights from 6 p.m. until 4 a.m. And it's an absolutely great hang. So yeah, uh, anyone who wants to come out and see us, we've got a couple of gigs coming up in Toronto. Fantastic. So you said uh, on the top that you got into this in the early, I guess, 2000s, was it? Yeah. When, uh, you had a lot of corporate governance issues. Um, some people thought that was sort of just like a, a trend at the time. Um, Enron uh, and uh, what was it? Global Networks or something like that. You know, Global Crossing, uh, um, uh, you know, Arthur Anderson, et cetera. Was, yeah. there, was there something wrong with corporate governance at the time or companies at the time, or was it just over attention by the uh, the SEC at the time? What's what's your assessment? Yeah, you know, if you'd asked me then, and then if you'd asked me ten years after that, and you asked me now, I'd have three different answers. And that's interesting. And, what are the three different answers? So I bought all the way in at the beginning to this very shareholder centric, you know, the shareholders got really, you know, the the results for them were very bad in the wake of Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, all that. And so the the regulators, of course, look at that and they say, OK, great. Well, now we've got Sarbanes-Oxley, which focuses a lot, uh, among other things, on director independence and audit committee independence and auditor independence and so on. And I thought that makes a lot of sense. Right, because we had failures that affected shareholders. Therefore, we need to take the take action to decrease the probability that the we'll have a repeat of Enron. And so then I spent ten years gathering data with the research center at the University of Toronto, looking at boards, and I, I eventually got more familiar with different types of models of corporations, not just other types of listed companies, although it would include things like dual class or family controlled. But I also got more familiar with cooperatives and I got more familiar with family enterprise and and government agencies and so on and seeing all the different models that were out there. And I started letting go a little bit of the orthodoxy that widely held publicly listed is the only appropriate governance model because it gives the most access to institutional shareholders to influence it, because i realized sure maybe that matters but it's not the only thing that matters right we care a lot about what actually happens in these boardrooms and you can look at embarrassing spectacular governance failures from dual class companies but Enron wasn't one of them, right? They were widely held company because we can also see spectacular failures from widely held companies. And you can see spectacular failures from crown corporations, but you can also see spectacular successes in all of these. And so I started wondering, 
well, why, right? Maybe we've obsessed over this one little thing too much. And so that was my first perspective shift. And then my my third perspective shift, which is more recently, is I actually sincerely believe that the model, the sort of corporate model and the regulatory framework, although they matter, they are only a small number of conditions that that affect our decisions and that the impact that that corporate leaders have on governance is maybe greater than we expected or greater than I had really appreciated for the first 20 years of my career, where an individual person can show up and make a really big difference because they see something really interesting or they're able to ask really not just provocative questions, but questions that open up dialogue in a way that help us to examine new possibilities or people who are able to communicate information in ways that is more likely to bring everybody at, into the same level and and engage at an appropriate you know level of detail or appropriate level of dreaming and we're starting to ask better questions we're starting to let go of this idea that oh well boardrooms only like only CEOs belong on boards well no we know that's not true CEOs are great and so are lots of other different types of people. And so now we're starting to dream a little bit bigger about who belongs. And if we know, if we take the, the all the amazing research that is out there on the way that groups of human beings make decisions together, just if we rewind back to that early 2000s correction, you know, the Sarbanes-Oxley style correction, where boardrooms became all about compliance instead of actual thoughtful decision making we realize ooh you know we're we're actually creating a risk here you know if we've got everybody concerned only about rule following we're missing opportunities to engage in sincere forward oriented and open minded decision making hmm. so some people think that that whole trend in the early 2000s um was overkill, uh, went too far. And, uh, and that, you know, there, there is always going to be some bad actors, but there wasn't all of a sudden a whole bunch of more bad actors, but right. for some reason there was this pile on, um, and, uh, and the SEC, the OSC wanted to make some examples of people. And, and so, yeah, maybe Enron was wrong, but, but, you know, there were some things like maybe Arthur Anderson or other places that they, they went too far on. What, what's your assessment looking back 20 years hence? I think it's, I mean, you might be right. Maybe there is an overcorrection. I do think the, com the the compliance and regulatory burden on boards is extreme, right? So they have to spend a lot of energy and effort and time and money on compliance. And that's, I think, in part, a result of what you're describing. I think my greater concern is less about the overcorrection and more about the fact that the the regulation or the regulatory response was designed as a reaction to as you've said, to outlier bad actors. And there's not, if we, instead of asking the question, okay, wait, should we be designing our regulation around bad, the really outlier bad actors to just sort of avoid that risk? Or should we be, should we be designing our regulation so that it helps to increase the probability that everybody does good? And I think that this reactive approach to regulation results not just in a compliance burden that is probably too much, but it also means that the compliance is pointed not in the right direction, right? We're complying for the sake of avoiding this very low probability cat catastrophe instead of complying in service of doing something really useful and good. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, you know, every day for the last uh, week or two weeks on the front page of the newspaper has been some article about Arrive Camp. Um, and and it would appear that something went really wrong uh, yeah. with that whole process. Have you looked at governance within civil service? Yeah, it's you know, there's certain parts of this that are completely inscrutable. So I, I'm going to be I'm going to avoid the temptation to, to to try to make assumptions about arrive Ken specifically because, as you say, something clearly went wrong there. But it's not 100 percent clear to me what. But I have looked at, I've had the, the great privilege of working with with crowns and agencies and boards and committees, uh, commissions at all levels of Canadian government and some in the U.S. And there are some really interesting, sticky challenges. Like I'll give a, a, a specific example of a type of challenge that doesn't really exist in the same way anywhere else. So at the municipal level, for instance, you'll see certain types of organizations, corporations, 
where you've got boards that are in part or in some cases almost exclusively made up of city councillors. And now imagine yourself in the position of one of those board members who's also a city councillor and you've got this legal duty as a board member to walk in the room and give equal weight to the interests of all the different stakeholders that are affected by the actions of the corporation. And you've then got this duty as a city councillor to prioritize the interests of the people who elected you. And you might be sitting there required to endorse a decision that goes against the interests of your constituents. And it's an impossible conflict to, to manage. I can't imagine what it must be like to be sitting in those positions and have to, on the one hand, defend this position, on the other hand, defend this position, and they're completely at odds with each other. So that's a that's the type of structural difficulty for this type of corporation that is, I'm not saying it doesn't exist elsewhere, but it's very amplified in these kinds of situations. And it, you see it in different types of of intensity. Provincial crowns are less likely to have elected officials, but they do have people who are directly appointed by ministers or premiers. And so they might feel like they have this direct obligation to the interests of the minister or the premier, even though legally speaking, their duty is defined otherwise. So it's an extremely complex, I don't envy their jobs, is I guess what I'm saying. Well, I think it's actually worse than the way you describe it. And and Maybe. you had sort of a, a Freudian slip in, in your answer to me where you said that they're, they're responsible for the people that elected them. I don't think they are, but they too often feel that way. I think they're responsible for all the citizens of, at at, at minimum, their, uh, their, their ward, which means the people that voted for them and the people that didn't vote right. for them and the people that didn't show up to vote at all. But they should be right. responsible for everyone in that ward because they represent well put. the ward. But, but really, they should be making decisions for the benefit of the citizens of the whole city rather than just their one ward. But I think you're right. Where too often some of them make decisions only for the people that voted for them because they're just appealing to their base because that's how they get their job next time. Right. Follow and I, I don't, I'm not saying this to be to try to criticize them or say that they're bad people or they've done something morally wrong. But I do really honestly believe that these putting that being in these positions, especially on the boards, the conflict is impossible to manage. And it's not their fault. It's structural. And I can't, as I say, I can't imagine myself being in that position and doing any better. Hmm. So you would think that uh, city councilors shouldn't be on uh, agency boards? In my preference for their sake and mine would be to, you know, it doesn't mean they don't have influence, but I can't, I don't see why they should be allowed to, to be voting board members when the conflict is completely unsolvable. Hmm, that's really interesting. We got to take a break for some messages and we're going to come back in two minutes with some concluding comments with Matt Fulbrook of the One Minute Governance uh, Podcast. Um, and uh, he's a governance expert, coach, and uh, and and writer, author, um, really smart guy. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Matt Fulbrook. He is a corporate governance advisor, writer, researcher, educator, coach with over 20 years of experience helping board of, uh, boards of directors and senior executives make great decisions. He is the host of two different podcasts, one called The One Minute Governance and the other one called Sound Up Governance Podcasters. He's the creator of Ground Up Governance Platform, the academic director of the Rotman ICDC uh, Board Dynamics Program, and he's also a bass player for Casey Roberts and the Live Revolution. Uh, his website is uh, www mattfulbrick.com if you want to check them out. Matt, I really enjoyed this conversation. Maybe just a couple of quick questions if I could. Sure. Um, CEO and uh, chair, should be the same role or two separate roles? Yeah, you know, I'm probably the only person in my field who doesn't have a strong opinion on this. I've, I've worked with many organizations where the role is combined and many where it's separated. I kind of feel like it's easier for, for most people when the roles are separated holding both is very very challenging but i've seen people do it really well i think it's completely situational and i think as long as we're not doing it in this super dogmatic way it can work well but it's uh, it, it's only one factor if you have a combined role then you need other ways to make sure that you're having both sides of the table, the executive side and the board side, making sure that their interests are well represented. So I, I don't have a strong opinion. I think it can work really well either way. 
I interviewed a guy a couple of weeks ago, mainly about civil service, which was interesting. Uh, but he said that uh, the corporate structure that had a CEO and a president and COO separated ended up working far better. And that the biggest problem in government is the lack of a COO type individual. What do you think? Uh, should you have I, those two roles? I think that's super interesting. In fact, I might take that. So I think I agree. I need to think about it more to have a strong opinion, but I think I agree. And I think I might even take it a step farther and say, you know, most of our corporate boards have, in my opinion, overcorrected on independence, where the only non-independent board member, voting board member is the CEO. And there's some research out there that suggests that it might be actually better to have at least two senior executives with voting board roles so that when, for instance, the COO is not only, not only does it exist, but they sit on the board and have a vote, they're more likely when the CEO makes a statement that's not entirely correct, the COO is more likely to say, actually, you know, because I've got, I'm a voting board member and my butt's on the line here, I need to take a second and correct you. And so you actually increase independent thinking by decreasing board independence. So I, I might take that even further. Well, that's kind of interesting as well. As I mentioned, I did some work with the DeGroote School of Business uh, um, Directors Program. And, and the final uh, retreat that they do is a case study uh, where they do a sort of a practice uh, board meeting. And uh -huh. I would play the role of the uh, the, the CFO. And, uh, and the issue there is that the board, and particularly the uh, the chair of the audit committee, have a responsibility to make sure that they access the opinions of what's going on from the CFO. And it yeah. almost comes down to the CFO needs to have more interaction with the board. What do you think about that? I think that the, the answer is 100% yes. I think that absolutely the board needs to have useful, not just practical and business relationships with the, the senior executives, but they also need trust, right? Because the if you don't have trust, and this is very, very, very common, to have a vibe in the boardroom where it's not appropriate to bring bad news. And boards, because they, you know, they're only there for the, the, the stats show that the board members spend at most 10% of the amount of time on their work as board members than executives do on their work as executives. And so the information asymmetry is significant. Boards rely heavily on managers for information and for facts. And if the vibe in the room is such that senior executives don't feel like they can bring the board bad news, that they don't, there's not this mutual trust, the board is, is at a huge risk of being underinformed. So I think yes, that relationship matters a lot. It's not just between board and CEO. It's in my opinion, it's even better if it's between the board and the rest of the executive team too. Is there a right size for the board? My sense is that boards used to be like, you know, 30, 40 strong, and now we're sort of in the in the low teens. Is there a right size? Uh, I This is another one where you, I think you'll find a lot of dogmatic responses uh, that you'll see. I And I, I've worked with a number of boards that have been very, very large compared to normal. So 30, 40, 50 people. And it's hard. It's really hard. Right. It's it, it requires a significant amount of discipline is very low probability. Everyone will have their voice heard. There's a lot of chaos. And so it can be really difficult. And I sometimes remind people who say, well, that's objectively bad. I say, well, what are the things that a large board could do that a small board can't? And I think some of those things are generating more ideas, having a great diversity of perspectives and so on. We just don't usually behave in boardrooms in ways that lean toward getting that. So if you had, let's say a board, I'll exaggerate, a board of five, it might be really efficient. You might have a lower probability of groupthink according to some of the research, but you also have a smaller diversity of perspectives. So either way, I think there's a way to get something great done, but you need completely different approaches for different types of board sizes for sure. And I, I don't think there's an ideal, but there's a reason why the typical board size now leans toward the sort of eight to 12, whereas it used to be like 20 or more. And and last question, most boards, um, I think in the last little while have been really actively trying to become more diverse, uh, whether it be in in sex or in race or 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 professional accreditation. Is that good or bad? You know, this is where I now have strong opinions. So I think the the short answer is yes, it's good. Uh, right. There's a the, if we if now that that I decided to for myself to frame corporate governance in the universe of decision making 
it makes it really, really clear the importance of diversity and diversity across lots of different intersecting factors. But demographic diversity is a shortcut to getting diversity of perspectives. The, the thing that I think boards are only just now starting to realize, because board diversity has had a significant amount of attention for the entire my entire career, what boards are starting to realize is diversity isn't enough, right? So if you have a room full of people who all have different backgrounds and cultures and perspectives and so on, you still have more work to do, which is, I guess, what you might call inclusion, to intentionally be interested in, in the conditions that will activate and synthesize those perspectives and make people feel safe to express them. So it's not just getting the people in the room, it's doing the work to make sure that they're empowered and engaged and effective. That's that old line. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. It's got right. to be something intentional that you really want to have those diverse points of view. Matt, this has been really interesting. I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed it too, Brian. Thanks for chatting. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Matt is uh, is available on mattfulbrook.com and his two uh, podcasts. Remind us what those podcasts are, sir. One Minute Governance, which is uh, season five is upcoming and Sound Up Governance. Fantastic. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and videos go up on my website the second that my broadcast goes to air. Stay tuned to my show tomorrow. Good night, everybody.